Hey, welcome back to Mobility Project. This episode is dedicated to Hell's Bells. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is kind of one of the more subtle uh, aspects of limiting hip range of motion. When, when we know, for example, that when an athlete, you know, we test an athlete, passive hip range of motion should be roughly about 130 degrees, 120, 130 degree range. And that should be clean range. There shouldn't be anything happening where at the end of the range, my hip comes up off the ground. Oftentimes what happens is that athletes end up magically in the 90 degree position, which is about where we see elliptical, where we see uh, athletes sitting at the desk, in the car, this magic 90 degrees, we just don't sit past that. And so the, one of the things that happens is that because I run into a kind of hip capsule tightness here, what I tend to see is that the hip doesn't, isn't very effective, the hip flexor isn't very effective at closing this joint. Basically the hip flexor is rendered kind of moot and impotent because it's run into a kind of a hard block and it just doesn't work very well. But what's interesting is that my cyclists in this position or my Olympic lifters in this position still magically, in spite of having such tight hips, can get deeper. What ends up happening is that, remember that trunk flexion or hip flexion is a, is a function of hip flexors and that psoas. And psoas goes from trunk to leg and hip flexors go from pelvis to leg. So if I'm not using this primary system or I've run out, I can continue to close off by yanking on my psoas and overextension. So one of the mechanisms or one of the problems we see is when athletes are missing flexion, they oftentimes end up overextending the bottom position in the hole, for example. I need lots of, lots of hip flexion. If I don't have it, boom, there's my mechanism for overextension. So what ends up happening is I see athletes who are missing hip flexion but end up having kind of SI related flexion, kind of gapping related problems. So this is what we're thinking about. One is that I've got to kind of deal with the psoas. So I'm going to show you a couple of deals with pieces of that today. And then I've got to deal with that hip flexion. We've talked a lot about how to manage that. Some of the easiest ways are, of course, to just do any of the flossing variations where I anchor the leg straight, fold over leg straight. We've done this with Aaron Kafaro, a rower, where I just put myself into this position, distracting backwards. I can do the super couch. All three variations are going to improve flexion, especially with the hip approximately in the back of the socket. I can test and retest that. That will unload that system. But I want to show you today some couple different ideas about dealing with psoas. For one, we tend to think that the best way to deal or treat this is to take that lacrosse ball and stick it in your stomach. And remember that psoas sort of runs from kind of the top, the base of your uh, of your ribs in the back here, L1, maybe there's some fibers that go higher, it runs all the way down inside your leg, crosses like a million joints. So I'm just going to take that ball, place it in there, next to the belly button, and then i got to do the informed freestyling in here, and I also want to make sure I add movement. It's that key that not just, I'm not just driving a nail through that system, but I'm going to go ahead and just floss back and forth. I'm in a pleasant uh, disposition face. I'm not suffering. I can internally actually rotate the leg, but it's that tack and stretch model that's really important. Can I catch the iliacus on the inside of the pelvis here? Absolutely. If I can kind of sneak in obliquely right on the inside, I may be able to catch or capture some of that iliacus as it blends into the psoas too. But what I want to show you today is a little bit different, is that sometimes we see that the nerve roots get entrapped in the, in the psoas, and some of my guys who are hyper hot from uh, old back injuries, like you know your airplane crashes or something, um, one of the things we can do is put the foot up, and then I can just floss back and forth. So the idea here is that I'm tensioning that sciatic nerve. I can place the ball on my psoas, and then I can kind of get down into some of that uh, deep bits down in my belly there. Ah, oh, that really distal psoas, and then I can wind that up, add a little tension in the leg. And then I can floss back and forth, and I swear I can feel that through the ball. And when I palpate some of my athletes doing the same thing, we can work on that same flossing here. This is a good way to unglue some of those sacral nerve roots as they kind of get entrapped in some of these tissues down in the bottom of the pelvis, ah, specifically that psoas. So you can easily hang out here and just practice gliding back and forth. And that's just it. You know, I get a quick tensioner come back out, quick tension to come back out, and what's really happening is I'm flossing that nerve through that psoas position. And you're gonna be shocked. Oh, I just felt like I gutted myself, Mel Gibson style. You're gonna be shocked at some of the, the range changes that you see in that. Especially as we move from an economy that is 
less overextended, more in neutral, the demands of this distal psoas become a lot higher. Because here, this is shortened tissue and this is taking the brunt of it. And then as soon as they come back out of man belly, suddenly this is much, much higher tension. Coupled with the fact that now I'm in this braced position uh, and I'm missing hip flexion, <coughs> bam, I'm overextended again. Some ideas about dealing with that. We'll see you guys tomorrow.